Hello, this is Jonathan Burnside here to talk with you about other searches. So these are just some other searching techniques you might use. They're not on the super commonly used side. There are some sort of edge cases where these techniques might uh, be an appropriate case, but they're not always the most common options. So one thing we might want to use is called a composite heuristic. All this really means, composite heuristic, is that we're combining multiple heuristics. So. In a navigation search, a really common heuristic to use is the straight line distance. I have a goal, I have my current location, what's the distance in between them? But maybe we don't want to just navigate between our start and end, maybe we want our agents to possibly pick up some things along the way. Well, we create paths that maybe aren't the best path, but it'll get them to pick some things up along the way. Well, how could we do that? Well, we could have two different heuristics that we combine one for the sort of straight line distance and one for how likely we should go pick up something or go off the path to go pick up something like this. A lot of different cases where we might have want multiple heuristics and there's a lot of different ways we can actually combine these. So a, a minimum function could be used. A minimum function, this would just mean of all the given possible heuristics for this search, we're gonna evaluate them all. Whichever one has the lowest value, that's the one we're gonna use. We could also do a maximum. It's just the opposite. Evaluate all the ones again, but whichever one has the maximum value will be the one we use. Um, we can also just sum them together, just add up all the heuristic results, or we could do a weighted sum. Uh, a weighted sum is just adding all the results together after we multiply those results by a given weight. So this will allow us to have one heuristic be more important than another heuristic. This is also good for a designer, might want to be able to sort of wiggle those values around a little bit to get different behaviors. Um, in some cases, we might not have enough uh, CPU time to actually do a standard pathing solution like A star or something where we would find our full path from where we are to where we want to go. Um, in this case, we might consider a trial and error search. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do trial and error searches, but the general idea means we're going to try to do something, and if it works out great, if it doesn't, we get an error, we'll, we'll try something else in some manner. So in terms of navigation, um, we're going to be at least somewhat informed. We still need to know where we want to go, where is the goal, and where we are. We're not going to do a whole pathing or anything like that. Um, you know, maybe the goal is off to the left. So each frame will move our agent off to the left, as long as that's still valid. Maybe eventually run into a wall or something. That's our error case. We, we kept trying to go to the left because that's where our goal was, and then we hit a wall and we had an error. At that point, we try something else. Maybe we move up or down uh, some other direction for this given frame. It is an iterative approach. Every frame, we're just trying what we currently think to be the best option seeing what it will do and, and trying to react to that, whether it was beneficial or if there was an error in that, that thing we tried. So the benefits are that it is incremental. There's very little sort of processing time power being used. You know, just move left. Don't iterate through all these nodes and figure stuff out. Very, very low cost. Low memory also, no search graphs, no storage of where we've been or anything like that. Very, very low memory. The low memory, though, is actually an issue, too. We have no idea where we've been in most trial and error searches, so there's no real way to prove that something we're trying hasn't already been proven to be a bad option. So in the case of uh, the guy navigating and bumping into a wall, you know, we might sort of bounce off, try going in another direction for a moment, but the algorithm doesn't know that last frame you bumped into a wall. And the next frame, it might bump into the exact same wall over and over and over, every frame trying to do something only to have an error and bump into a wall or something like that. Trial and error searches are not optimal or complete. We really don't know for sure that you'll ever reach it. You might go into some weird sort of concave tunnel and get kind of stuck in there acting very silly. They also tend to be a little bit random looking. Certainly if you know your goal is off to the left and your agent starts walking left, that looks good as a starting point. But if he starts bumping into a walls or, or sort of trying random based solutions to any sort of errors along the way, it's going to look and be fairly unpredictable, somewhat random. So the real you know, sort of use case for trial and error searches is, well, first, 
Do we just not have the CPU time to do a, a full path plan? And does our search pace have fairly few obstacles? We have too many walls and things. Trial and error is probably just not going to ever find a good solution or find a way to our goal. Uh, we can also use depth first searches. Um, depth first searches are going to be better than breadth first searches in terms of memory. Most depth first searches are going to end up using a lot less uh, system memory at any given time for finding their solutions, where breadth first search, you know, sort of each breath or ply kind of in memory as we continue to go deeper and deeper, all the sort of previous nodes remain in memory somewhere. Whereas the depth first search, it's only one node per ply that we care about that might be on the stack as we're going deeper and deeper to search for our goal that we're looking for. So benefits for depth first search, of course, much less memory. Like I said, we only have the sort of one node per ply. Um, and it's fairly easy to write. I'm assuming you, you're okay with uh, recursion. The depth first search is not a whole lot of code, not terribly complex usually. So while it saves us memory, that again becomes kind of a problem case also. We don't have any um, sort of dupe checking. We can't tell if we've already searched a given node or redoing this sort of work and things. It's not stored where we've been already. Um, it can take a very long time to execute. Of course, this is going to be based on uh, the size of your tree, more specifically how deep it is usually. Um, sort of special case on depth first search would be iteratively deepening depth first search. Sort of works the same way. We're, we're doing a depth first search, except we keep a maximum depth that we're going to go to on any given search. So while we're doing this uh, depth first search, we'll actually evaluate, well, what is my current depth? How far into the tree am I compared to what my maximum value is right now? And you won't go beyond that maximum value. So maybe that max depth starts at a depth of one. So we'll evaluate the root node, We'll evaluate all of its children, um, but that's that's a depth of one at that point. So we won't evaluate any of the children's children, which would be at a depth of two. If we don't find the solution, well, we throw out all the work we just did, start all over again, but we increase that max depth. So we search the tree again with a max depth of two. Did that work? Great. If not, start all over again with a max depth of three, four, five, six, so on. There's not a huge number of cases where iteratively deepening depth first searches are super useful. You know, they do have, just like depth first searches, they have low memory overhead, so we, we get that benefit. There are some cases in AI where these do get used somewhat often. Action planning is one case um, where you might use iteratively deepening A star. Very similar idea, we're just doing A star, so with a max depth. But this works well in action planning. Often the solution we need is not usually very deep. We're not going to redo our work too many times in, in that case. We don't want to do this technique with a tree that's going to be very deep because every time that we don't find a solution at the current max depth, we have to start all over and any of that time was effectively wasted or at least the only thing it gained us was the knowledge that we need to look one depth lower. The interesting thing here, though, is that iterative deepening depth for searches are optimal and complete. Um, since we're only ever, we have this sort of max depth, we're never going to find a solution that isn't the optimal solution. Depth first search is not optimal. It's totally possible we could you know, go all the way down the left hand side of the tree, find a viable solution, and it be the worst possible solution. Iterative deepening depth first will not do that. We will get an optimal solution because we're only looking at down to that max depth and incrementing it one time every time we fail to find a solution. So whichever solution we find will be the shallowest, the lowest depth one, and will be an optimal solution. Thank you for listening. Good luck.